So welcome to that session after lunch. I hope you're well fed. I hope you're not too well fed that you just fall asleep in the next hour. But if you do, I'm pro I promise not to scream or do anything like that. So rest well and be relaxed for the next talk then afterwards. So I'll start with two bad messages and a good one in between. So the first bad message is um, if you attended Vladek's talk yesterday, um, some of the things that I will be talking about will sound familiar to you. But, but the good part of the message is, um, number one, you can't repeat it often enough, so maybe that's a good part. And on the other hand, um, I come from a different angle, and maybe that gives you some new ideas or something like that. I mean, that's the only thing that I can try to achieve in an hour, to give you some ideas, some pointers, something like that, some things to ponder. The next bad message is, I've got way too much stuff in my presentation. So I have no clue how to fit that into an hour. Probably we will have the next half in the next year or something like that, the second half or something like that. Okay, or I try something different. So I will be quite fast and shallow on the things that lead to somewhere. And then on the juicy parts, um, I will try to slow down a little bit, something like that. So whenever I go slow, just wake up for a few minutes and then <laughs> it's safe to fall asleep when I speed up again, okay? <laughs> All right. So my name is Uwe Friedrichsen, and I won't bore you with a lot of details and so on. Um, I mean, I complain that I've got too much stuff, and then I'm going to talk for eons about that one. No, that doesn't make any sense. The, the only maybe interesting thing, if you want to come back to me, is that this you free this, this abbreviation, you will find that on Twitter. For, uh, if you want to reach me there, you will find it on, uh, for my slide share for the, uh, for the slides over there. I will publish them later. And you will also find it on Medium. I try to um, put everything that I talk about and a little bit more into a blog series or something like that. But it will take, um, give me a month or two or something to sort all that stuff out and then start publishing um, all that stuff. So that's basically everything you need to know about that. And now let's start up. I had something with cloud native, oh, hype, cool, bingo uh, in my title. And so what's that cloud native thing? And if we look around, we found the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and they have a definition of cloud native, and which I don't like very much because it's a half-hearted definition. If you have 300 companies that come together and try to come up with the definition, yeah, they usually end up either with the... Um, intersection of all opinions or the union of all opinions. This is an intersection of all opinions definition, of course. Um, so yeah, grab your favorite framework, put it into a micro, uh, create a microservice from that, and then put it into a Docker container and run it on Kubernetes. That's basically what's on there. And so all the juicy parts of um, Cloud Native are not in there. But for what we are talking about today, that's good enough. So well, fair, we, leave, we let them live, okay? And because the key part is, what are the consequences? And this, these are the same with this definition or with a better one. The consequences are, you go cloud native. And cloud native means you pack, package your stuff into containers, which means you have different processes at runtime, which then means, yeah, well, remote communication between the services. Hello, welcome, we build a distributed system. Cool, yeah. And Let's not limit it to cloud native, to be honest. I mean, as Chess Emmerich said, almost every system is a distributed system these days. And chances are very high that the software that even you work on is part of a distributed system, uh, system landscape. So and you say, yeah, no, I'm not working on a big monolith. Yeah, well, this big monolith is usually talking to a database, and, which is remote communication, and it's talking to some kind of directory server or some other kind of IAM solution, which is distributed. and it, ask or sends information to another system, which is distributed. It's all remote communication. So yeah, we're working in a distributed landscape these days, usually. What are the consequences of going distributed? Um, so yeah, this is distributed in a nutshell. So um, I'm in a distributed, uh, I'm working for, in distributed systems for 20 years, meanwhile, or 25 years almost. Um, I s hope that I start to understand the meanwhile a little bit, but um, if I wanted to have to put it in a nutshell, Werner Vogels already did that for me because that's his famous quote. Yeah, things break, and why are they breaking? Distributed systems have um, some specific failure modes that you don't see in non-distributed systems. 
And most people just think about the crash failures, which are the easiest one, but the other ones are the ones that really are turning our life into hell if we work on distributed systems. So latency and all that other stuff, which really happens further down. And the effects of these kind of failure classes are something like lost messages, incomplete messages, and message duplication, and all that other stuff um, out of sync um, between different nodes, and yeah, all that stuff happens to us, and we have to deal with it. It, it, it hits us on the application level. And it, hit, it um, happens to us because the communication between the system, this remote communication, is non-deterministic in its behavior. So when you are in a local system and you say, um, I call somebody uh, a different pa part of my system, and then, yeah, I get a result back, and usually the right result, uh, unless I program something wrong or something like that. Uh, in a distributed system, so if X then Y, or if I call that, I get guaranteed some response, it's, yeah, maybe I get And this maybe, that's, that's a real game changer. So this, we have a probability of being successful, and these probabilities somehow multiply up, and all, all these bad things happen, and we have to deal with that. And if we change the point of view, we can also say, okay, this remote communication points, these are the predetermined breaking points of my application. So whenever I go out of a process context and call another process context, this is one of these situations where there's a likelihood that things will break. I mean, if it breaks inside my process, um, well, I'm dead too, and so I don't have any trouble with that anymore. But outside the process, I'm still alive and see that don't get the right response or delayed or in the wrong order and all that stuff. So, and it will hit me, hit me on the application level. Hmm which makes our customer experience a bit worse. And we don't like that. Um, if our customers are ha unhappy, our product owners are unhappy, and then we get unhappy, and yeah, we want to change that. And then what can, can we do about that? And there are a lot of things possible. So usually what we did in the past is then, yeah, buy high availability hardware, which is nice for crash failures, but unfortunately it doesn't scale, really. And um, so we had that talk about system theory, and we again have a system, and the, the thing between the systems is the interesting parts in here, and they will still fail in some way. So three systems with high availability hardware, yeah, that could be good enough for your needs, so that you get enough nines behind the comma, or at least a dot five or something like that overall availability. 50 of those won't work. So it's not really working. Then, yeah, we leave that to the infrastructure to handle that. We had that in the past. Um, these days, this is called a service mesh. If we're in a microservice landscape. So, yeah, there's that Istio or that Linkerd, and they're going to handle, they do the, um, the circuit breaker stuff and the retries and all that. And yeah, we are safe. Yeah, well, partially, because they have just a generic way of responding to failure. I mean, assume the situation when you stand somewhere in the room and turn to the neighbor and say, well, well, that's fine. Or a different situation, say, well, my colleague over there just had a heart attack. Could you please call a doctor? And um, so if you just have a generic response to that, then either in the one situation you would say, what you the weather's fine, would you please um, then respond to me that you also like the weather today or something like that? Or the other way, um, yeah, well, it's not responding, so we probably let him die and that's all, everything's fine or something. So on the application level, it might be very different what you actually need as a response pattern and we have to deal with that. So it's just a partial relief. And then we start to implement the resilience patterns. I did a lot of talks and workshops and stuff about that in the last years, um, which also helped to a certain degree. The problem is just, for instance, if you have a situation where you have a service over here, which must be up and running to enable that other service over there to give a response back to the customer, and this service fails, then the circuit breaker in between, which is a nice pattern, just tells you, well, you're dead. <laughs> And which doesn't really help us. So because the design was bad, um, we're not able really to guarantee availability and response times and all that stuff. So in the end, without a good design, all these measures don't help us. And well, we're back to design, bad thing. You know, that's thing that we can't buy, that's just in our brains and that we really have to think about and waste energy and all that stuff. 
and eat a lot of whatever, yeah, sweets and drink. Um, yeah, you know what I mean. And so that's what we ultimately need. So we need also need a good design. All the other stuff can just support us to a certain degree. All right. And most of the idea of the design then in distributed system is um, reduce the number of remote communication points because they're the predetermined breaking points of my application. And we have two options to do that, obviously. The first one is, yeah, more coarse-grained services. And I, I talk about that for a minute or something like that. And um, the other one is the more interesting but the more challenging one is getting the communication between the services better. So distribute my functionality, the business logic, between these pieces in a way that I don't need to have so many calls forth and back. Yeah, sounds familiar. I know that's this bounded contact thing, but it's not only bounded contact. It's, um, I'll talk about that, uh, the problems with that later. Let's talk about that for a second, or a minute. Yeah, I'm not that fast. You remember that one? Yeah. The first law of distributed objects, don't distribute objects. Because if you don't need it, um, you pay a high price for distributed things. <coughs> so, my rule of thumb is then, yeah, if you can get away with a monolith, well, it's fine. I mean, from a deployment point of view or an operational point of view, that's the best possible deployment style possible, uh, best possible deployment style that you can have. I mean, it's a single process on a single node, perfect in terms of robustness and so. It might, you might have, you might need to cover for the fa for the fact uh, or for the um, pro uh, probability or possibility that your node will fail, but then a load balancer and two or three instances next to each other with a shared database. It's okay if you can get along with that in terms of operations. That's a great idea. Unfortunately, our business domain will usually be a little bit too big to put everything in a single business domain into a monolith. So we have to split up in some way and in some degree. And then to refine my rule of thumb, my current rule of thumb for going into splitting things up is twofold. The general one is, of course, always think twice if you really need to do that, because at the moment it's still a fashion, going smaller, 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 smaller. Why? Uh, because we can do that, yeah, no, but you shouldn't do that. Um, so do you really need that? Yeah, but it's cool, and I always wanted to use that frameworks. Yeah, you really know what you're doing, what you're building up on accidental complexity right now without solving a business problem. That's not a good idea. And therefore, only if you really need independent deployments. If you need teams that independently work on different capabilities or pieces of your business functionality and which really need to go independent. It's a big story about this independence and if you need them and when you need them and so on, but it's out of scope for today. I had whole talks about that, so I could talk about an hour when you need that and when you don't need that. So if you're not sure, when you really need to go, need, when you really need independent teams, well, go and Google for that and build up your opinion on that. And there's an addendum to that, an augmenting rule. Sometimes the non-functional requirements between disparate parts of our functionality are so different that it really makes sense to run them independently. For instance, security, you have this little bit of highly um, confidential data over here, and you have a huge chunk of data which you don't have speci specific security requirements about. Why put them all together and implement all the security measures for all that pieces of data that don't need to be secured in some way, or also logic in some way? Availability, reliability, of course. Scalability, unfortunately, in the microservice discussion, there are always the people come along and say, yeah, we need them for scalability. Um, you need them less often than most people think for scalability. So whenever you feel the urge to say, I need that for scalability, then repeat for yourself, I am not Netflix. I am not Netflix. I am. <laughs> we are not. <laughs> so we need them less, less off, uh, a lot less often for sc uh, scalability than most people try to make us think. Or portability and all these other things. That can, might be non-functional requirements that really create a use case for splitting them apart so that there's value in there. Yeah. 
Okay. Let's move on. This will be the reminder of the talk. <laughs> because that's the part where we still, yeah, let's use the bad word, where we still suck for 450 years meanwhile, getting these things right. And I'd try to take a little, use case, a little case study to illustrate what I mean. So if I have a case study, well, the typical one, a very simple e-commerce shop. Um, everybody has some idea about e-commerce shops. Therefore, it makes a nice case study. So, and we have very uh, only the core functionality. So searching and showing articles, putting stuff into the shopping cart, doing the checkout, doing the shipment. And um, yeah, the payments only touch as a black box because they make the things complicated. So that's just one remote call and everything's fine. It never is in a real e-commerce system, but let's assume it would be that way. And also no recommendations and all that stuff. Well, very, very simple idea. Of, um, before we move on, um, keep in mind that our core business goals are, put, uh, are hidden in the use cases checkout and shipment. Because with checkout, we make money, and with shipment, we make customers happy. Um, in the end, that's, these are the things that um, are really important, because I will come back to that. And then we start with our typical design. Well, counter example. So it never happens exactly this way. So usually design is a false and back and up and down and going this gray and then going back and so on. But if you try, uh, if the design is uh, completed and you go back and say, what happened there? And you would try to distill a little algorithm for that. It's mostly what I try to distill here. And it works like that. So first of all, we focus on redundancy. So avoiding redundancy and maximizing reuse, of course. I mean, redundancy is bad. We learned that for 40 years and reuse is good. And by the way, I'm not saying that redundancy is not bad, and I'm not saying that reuse is go, uh, not, doing no reuse is good or something like that. It's just a price that you pay for going that way. In a distributed system, that price is high. You have to be aware of that fact. And we first start with, yeah, trying to carve out the domain, but when we try to carve out the domain, we are so much used to yeah, looking for the entities, basically. I mean, even if we use the DDD ideas um, in, a, yeah, in a sort of simple or na naive way, we would also say, ah, where are the entity <laughs> objects, where are the value objects, where are our aggregates, very data-focused, more or less. And then we look around and say, yeah, well, we have a customer, and there are some information to the customer, and we have that product with all the product information in there, so something, name, description, images, and price for searching and showing, and then items, stock, and packaging information for the shipment part, basically all that put together. And then, of course, we have an order with the customer who ordered that, the order items in there, and some pay payment and shipping information which is in there. Well, nice. Usually, again, it doesn't. We don't start with that, but somehow we tend to focus a bit on that. We, we heard that pattern as a recurring pattern that we heard over the conference with that problem with the data model. OK, and two associations in between, well, of course, M2N. And then we wrap more or less the entities with services. So what I see very often in system design is something like that. We have the customer service and the product service and the order service. So entity service, entity service, entity service. And yeah, with their own databases and with the relations in between. OK. And then we start somehow to spread the functionality across these services that we just created. And so we go along the use cases and we say, well, search, show, yeah, that works on the product. That's nice. Add to shopping cart, yeah, it has to do something to do with order. That's nice. Then we go on and say, checkout. Ooh, checkout. Somehow it, it needs all of them. It doesn't work so well. So we have no idea what to do. And then, yeah, what we do, of course, then is we create process services for these complicated things. So for these complex use cases which operate on several entity services. And then we have that checkout service. And on the other hand, we have the shipment service, which has the same problem. So, and yeah, then we look on that and say, well, anything missing still in there? 
And what we see then is, yeah, well, we have no idea how to update the customer information to the product information. There are some maintenance use cases missing. And so we add the maintenance use cases that we found along the way. So like here, some piece of uh, product catalog maintenance and up there, customer self-service. Well, well, that's basically the design. I, I, I think many of you have seen such designs in some way before. And they look nice in some way and innocuous. So, and I mean, that, is there anything wrong about that? I'm not sure. So, but my question then is, how good is this in terms of remote communication? And let's use that type of diagram of UML that nobody ever used the behavioral diagrams. I mean, whenever we use UML diagrams or any kind of notation, we only use, only use the static notations. So the class diagrams or the component diagrams or, or, or even not UML, but we, we still do, do make kept packages or classes or components and something like that. We never do interactions so much, but let's do an interaction for a second here. And let's look at the checkout process, which looks like that because the checkout service don't ha doesn't have any data, so it has to go forth and back to the data and so on and get it and update it and change it and go back to the user and so on. And uh, we could optimize a little bit in here if you would like to do that, but in the end, there would be quite a lot of requests which would add up in terms of latency to get the job done and which would also add up in terms of reduced availability. So higher likelihood that something goes wrong in here. And shipment basically looks the same. Again, these are the two use cases that um, are usually used. Uh, the, these are the most business critical use cases. This is our business goal, that these two work fine. So what we learn is then in finding is that hmm, our core use cases are a bit failure prone and slow, while if we would have that done the same diagrams for our data maintenance use cases, well, they just work in one service. They're really fast and robust. They work like hell. Or to put it in a little bit more ironic way, congratulations, you just designed a system for a company whose core business purpose is maintaining data, not making money. Well, hmm. to be honest, nobody designs a system which goes, so deliberately designs a system which goes against the business goals. So somehow this had happened. And which, which were the properties that led into that direction, basically? So from what I see in there, it's first of all, it's always looking at this is looking on redund avoiding redundancy and optimizing reuse. I will come back on that if you say, is reuse bad? No, it's not bad, but again, it's had a, it has a price. And it's basically based on these traditional old practices that we don't get rid of, even if we try for 20 years now to get rid of these practices in some way. But it's so, and it, it ends up in some kind of high coupling and, yeah, well, a moderate cohesion between all the uh, inside the service, but a quite high coupling in, uh, between the services. So checkout service doesn't work if all the other services are not available. And again, this is the most critical one. That's the one what we're making money with. And my take on that is, yeah, for CRUD applications, that's okay. But I still would go, rather go then, instead of for a service design, uh, try to use a scaffolding framework, a generator, or something like that, just model my data, and then... Whoop. I mean, back in the 90s, we had this, we always called the power blender, power builder. I'm not sure if somebody still remembers that. But you model the data model as you more or less press the button, and then all the UI was there. The UI wasn't very nice, but it was efficient, and you could use it. And well, it's, but um, while a typical Java programmer these days um, would be writing about half a year to create that application that was done in, a, in, a, in the morning. Yeah. And, it's a bit, little bit more productive. That's good enough, usually. For single process applications, or that approach still is OK. It's fine. Sometimes, it's in some places, it might affect the maintainability negatively because we have these high couplings. And then what's dependent on what? If I change something here, what else is going to fall apart on the other side, and so on. In distributed system, yeah, I think it's a bad idea because it creates a big failure surface and <coughs> quite bad response times. So well, obvious question, 
How can we do better? And if you know me from somewhere else, you know I'm an old fart, and I always recommend to look what the even older farts told about how to design systems. So there's a lot of wisdom out there um, from the early years in IT. And so let's look for some stuff which could help us. I, I already mentioned this high cohesion, low coupling thing. And so let's go back to the original paper, which is, um, you mentioned Myers yesterday also. Um, I went just back a little bit more to the paper, not the book. <laughs> yeah, structured design, which uh, Myers wrote together with Stevens and Constantine. And, um, this was the paper where originally the concept of um, high cohesion low coupling was coined. And it's quite interesting. If you look in there, say, yeah, well, if we're able to minimize the connections between modules, it also minimizes the passes along which changes and errors can propagate into other parts of the system. Oh, that. So let's replace module by service or microservice. And, well, it doesn't sound too bad. And also, eliminating disastrous ripple effects where problems in one piece, in one place, can then cause problems in other places. Yeah, well, we think that's worth following. And so in this minimizing connections, they call it coupling. So the measure of strength of an association established by a connection from one module to another. Always replace in your mind, do this search replace um, by Search module, replace with service or microservice in your mind. Then you're there where I want to be. Okay, and we try to keep that low. And they also delivered some kind of instructions how to achieve a low coupling. And what they talked about was interface complexity. So simple, obvious interface is um, low coupling. A highly obscure interface is high coupling. Connection, so to module by name, to internal environment. So these days you would say, depending on the interface or depending on the implementation, is then low and high coupling. And then type of communication they added will say, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. In some way, the, the first one, the, the third one, we don't see that often anymore these days. Data coupling is um, when, the when we don't handle the control flow. So we do just something, we provide some kind of data, and then the control flow is, contr is more or less controlled by the outside. So we don't hand over the control explicitly to somewhere, but we just provide some kind of data and then something happens. So if you feel reminded of message-based actor systems or if you feel reminded of event-driven systems, well, that's what we're talking about here, actually. And um, explicit, that's more REST. So um, I call over there, HTTP, re request response. Sometime. In hybrid, that's uh, something, yeah, um, which mostly if you say, yeah, well, then do that check or don't do that check or use version A or version B of your algorithm. So if you really refer to the control flow, which is used internally in that service, we had that a lot back in the early 70s. We don't see that that often anymore these days, which is okay. But, and here's a caveat, if you always go to the old papers like I like to do, it was written in a very different time with very different problems. They struggled inside a process to get a design right, to make design understandable, maintainable, changeable. So getting away from the original big ball of mud inside a monolith and figuring out how to do that better. And all these heuristics help nicely. The core concepts, like strive for low cohesion, high coupling, are still valid. The instructions need to be rethought in our context. You have to do that with all these papers. It's important because I sometimes also see these cargo cults where they say, yeah, let's build the same kind of structure that the people did in the 70s because they had a good idea. Yeah, well, they had a ter terrific idea, but they solved a different problem back then, and so just, let's just extract the idea and then apply that to our problem of today and update it gently to our context. And I try to do it here, and I think if we talk about service design, we need an, one more concept in here, and that's functional independence, the concept of functional independence. From being completely independent, which means if... I don't need that other service at all to get my job done, over partly dependent, which is then, okay, if that other service is down, I can still deliver some kind of service, but with a 
reduced service level, so graceful degradation of service, what we always hear when we talk about resilience engineering and so on, or fully dependent. If that one's down, I'm also dead. So, and all the nuances in between. And that's very important to have that in mind if we talk about service design these days, I think. And then they also talked to complete the picture about cohesion. And the interesting part for me is that high cohesion is not necessarily important in some way in this context. High cohesion, what they're saying is, okay, we have two ways. So our core goal is get a low coupling between the components. And we have two ways of achieving that or supporting that. The one is, let's try to minimize the connections between these things and the dependencies between them, or maximize the binding inside a component, inside a module, inside a service. Because that usually helps us that these maximized bindings don't go out across the boundaries. So high cohesion is supporting, but not necessary. The same thing um, with getting more coarse-grained components. It can be fine in terms of robustness to have yeah, a not so high cohesion in between. Um, they also had some ideas how to implement all that stuff and some instructions for that. And, and, and. the problem is then, again, they solved a different problem back then, um, getting some maintainable code base in place. And if we would apply that on service design, we would end up with nano or even Pico services. And we don't want to do that because that would be then structured design divide and conquer, decompose into the tiniest pieces and put them back together. And this gives us then this, how did you call that? A distributed ball of mud in the end. So it would be the wrong force in the end if we overdo that. So therefore, I don't go into, into that. One interesting remark before we move on, um, I also looked in on one of my favorite papers from back then, the Panas paper from 72, two years earlier. And he talked about Two things, uh, basically about um, information hiding, which, by the way, becomes very interesting if we dis, uh, would discuss API design, which we won't do this today, and um, separations of concern. Um, he didn't call that separations of concern because the term separation of concern was coined by Dijkstra two years later. And so he didn't have the term yet. Um, so 74, Dijkstra came up with this notion of separations of concerns. And also, this paper, while having a good, many good ideas, also, um, more or less, the instructions in the papers, they aim at um, creating a maintainable code base. And if we would apply that on service design, we would still, again, end up in nano or pico services, which you don't want to do. So the original idea, care about separation of concerns, care about information hiding, is very valuable these days. The instruction in the paper, well, be careful about those. You will find that in many other places, like No Silver Bullet and so on, and that there are a lot of papers out there where the core reasoning, the insights are really cool and are really valuable still these days, and the instructions, no, don't do that. So let's wrap up the research part. High cohesion, low coupling leads the right way, I think. The original instructions shouldn't be followed. We need to update them for our, current, for our current context, which is distributed systems, service design, reducing the number of predetermined breaking points, so remote communication. It works a little bit differently then. So we have to rethink that. And therefore, what I try to do here, my take on that is, I use that concept of functional independence, which also reduces the risk of vertical decomposition, which is a little warning that I also would like to add. What does vertical decomposition mean? If you have a piece of functionality which is used from the outside in some way, it's just a block of functionality, business logic, whatever, plus data, and so on. We have basically two choices to split that apart. The one is, vertical decomposition, which is the layering approach. So build tiny pieces, aggregate them together into more powerful pieces, aggregate, so compose your functionality. Also functional programming goes that way and so on. And it, um, but usually um, in most systems we don't have a functional program, we have a different approach in here, but also still this layered approach in there. And the other one, 
goes that one as horizontal decomposition, which is more um, towards segregation. So getting independent units of work and each one serves a different need from the outside. Uh, in practice, we usually find both of them somehow combined in our designs. And they have very different properties, these types of segregating your functionality. The first one, vertical, is this used relation and it's mostly driven on reuse and avoidance redundancy. And yeah, it, it creates a strong coupling because if something further down does not work, all the stuff higher up doesn't work, which inside a process is perfectly fine. And it's a very valuable pattern in the, inside a process. Across process boundaries, well, it can send you straight to hell. So I wouldn't recommend to use that in service design, this kind of approach, this layered service approach. Maybe you who suffered through the SOA 1.0 times still know layered SOA. It's an anti-pattern. And horizontal decomposition has a different force. I mean, in architecture, it's all in design, it's all about forces. It's not about right or wrong or something like that. Forces push you into a certain direction. So, and it's based on this function segregation. It's more the drivers are more rather than, uh, than um, reuse and, uh, and this um, redundancy avoidance. It's rather thinking about autonomy and independence of pieces or maybe even about of the organization on top of that. So it creates a rather low coupling. So in terms of high functional independence, which is a very useful pattern, I think, across process boundaries. It can also be helpful inside a process boundary, but there are different forces which are important and different constraints. So it can support you in there, but um, across process boundaries, I think it's essential. So I recommend to use that inside a process boundary. But there's still a problem. And the biggest problem is this one. Most of us only know the vertical design, the vertical decomposition of work, because the default thing. That's what we learn in university. That's what we get told every single day in our training. Look for dry, look for reusability. Even our IDEs support that, extract method and so on. So avoid redundancy, go for reuse and all that. And again, inside a process, very valuable pattern. Across process boundaries, well not so valuable from my experience. And, but it's everywhere. And most people, so let's complete that. Most people don't know anything else. And if we try to do something which we don't know how to do, it really creates, it needs energy. Our brain, if we don't take any, uh, if we don't use any energy, will always lead us into vertical decomposition because that's what we do if we are woken up at night at 3 a.m. and someone do a design, we would use that. <laughs> Half asleep, we, are, we exactly know our brain doesn't need any energy for that. We do that by heart. But going this other way really is hard to do. We really have to focus on that. We really have to focus, not fall back into the old pattern. It's, it feels uncomfortable. It's, ah, yeah. So, and that's what I see most of the time. So most people start with that and boop, fall around again. So fall back into the old habits. It's too energy wasting, too exhausting. Go there. Just have that in mind when you say, yeah, well, everything's easy. No, it's not that easy. We are driven by habits, and our habit is what we've been taught, talked, or taught for the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on how long you are in the industry. Okay. You want to learn this horizontal decomposition to reduce the number of breaking points and so on and blah, blah. How can we do that? Where can we learn that? And yeah. Um, even outside the DDD community, then always this pops up. My take on that, it's a valuable book. The problem is outside the DDD community, usually only that pops up. This book, exactly, that one. Nothing else, not... Um, I don't know, in the one word, or anybody else, and so on, and all the other people who moved on from that and built on that. We're still back to that book, these patterns, these 30 patterns or whatever that is. And well, my take on that, if I want to learn to do horizontal decomposition from the book, so 
most people only read the half, first half of the book, and then they get tired, and they say, yeah, we've learned everything, which is these, uh, these building block pattern section, the first half of it. And unfortunately, that's mostly would lead us to the design we've seen just before, especially the service pattern that um, Eric Evans described back in there. For me, it's an anti-pattern, because it's this process pattern, what he described in there. So, if anyone says, yeah, we do DDD, DDD is cool, and hey, there's even a service pattern, so we know how to do service design. We use the pattern. Hmm. Dangerous path, from my opinion. So what I like is uh, two patterns which are more to the end of the book, which is conceptual contours and bounded contexts. The uh, I'm not going to into detail of these patterns. Uh, there are other people who did that often enough, usually. Um, the problem is that usually contextual contours are a little bit too fine-grained for service design, and bounded context often is too coarse-grained for service design. So it's also just, yeah, in terms of the problem that I just sketched, I, say, uh, I end up with mixed emotions. I like the book. I like the ideas in there. I think they're very valuable, and they... Eric Evans did a, uh, a terrific job to the whole um, industry IT writing that book and everybody else who built on that. So nothing wrong with DDD, nothing wrong with the book, but this is a very specific problem and it just helps me halfway. Which then of course leads the question, well, nice. And so you're saying, Here's the problem, this is not a solution, and now? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not perfectly sure how to do that, but uh, my take, which helped me most of the time, is going with that idea. We start with the behavior. What does that mean? Let's go back to our case study. I added the two additional use cases. Uh, let's start with the behavior. So, but first, let's refine the thought that's behind that. So, if we try to reduce the number of remote calls that we need to complete a given functionality, we need to spread the service, the functionality between the service in a way, and here's the core point, that a single use case or a single user interaction less often needs to cross service boundaries. So yeah, sure, a monolith would optimize that, no, sir, no crosses at all, but on the other hand, we have also forces which drive us into not having a monolith. But still, we try to minimize the need to go across service boundaries to complete a use case or user interaction. So user interaction, if we really forget everything which happened uh, or was, what was written about use cases um, after 96, um, and just keep the good parts of it. So, and just forget all the bogus which came behind that. And quite often we had a very simple but powerful way to note down use case, which is actor system. So actor does something, um, does something force back. These are the user interactions. Very powerful to understand what, how the interaction patterns are. Still very valuable. Still, unfortunately, most people have forgotten that and only remember these six-page long templates, um, how to fill out a use case form, and then said, that sucks, so they, let's not use, do use cases. I think use cases are still have. And yeah, we try to organize our service around these use case interactions. So, let's write them down. These are the six use cases in our system. Here are the different actors. By the way, the actors also, having the actors has a value in some way. <coughs> we see three different actors. Can be an indicator for cohesion boundaries. Usually it means that we have different UIs, which is a different, is a different thing, but also in terms of um, architecture important. And it can even lead us to completely different architectural approaches for the different actors. Um, so additional options in terms of architectural work. So if we would like, for instance, we could have up there, we could have a mobile first front end with service oriented back end um, for the customer because usually for our good customers always often order that while they're on the go, not on a desktop machine, while they like to do their customer self-care stuff, so updating their customer inter information more on the front end, uh, on the browser front end, or on desktop or notebook machine. The warehouse employee might have a very special device then here um, with a monolithic backend, and even here that could be a rich desktop application for the 
uh, back office op um, employee for product code catalog maintenance. It's, it's just additional options. But let's go back to the design problem. Six use cases. And here again, it's never that straightforward, but that's the idea, the algorithmic idea. So first thing is, every use case is a service candidate. OK, candidate. MD is master data down here. Now, there are two possibilities that we have. The first one is, the use case is too big. So we have to split that up, maybe in interactions or in some different ways. Again, use the same forces that I described before, only if we need multiple teams or if we have very disparate non-functional requirements. Then this might be a good place to split that up. In here, in our example, well, we don't need that. It's very simple use cases in here. Yeah, I'm lucky. <laughs> I got, a lot, <laughs> got away with that. Then, and then we have also to look into the other direction. Again, this is not usually one, two, three. It's always happening forth and back all the time and so on. So we do all that across the time of your design. And, and let's try, can we group things together? Again, the idea is low coupling is important. High cohesion is optional. So yeah. Um, if we get a better trade-off in putting things together um, overall in our design, maybe it's okay to go uh, to get along with a service where the parts in there don't have so much cohesion as long as the overall picture is be uh, becomes better. So if our overall design decision is better. So let's look here. And a good thing to start with is looking at the data. I mean, we didn't talk about data, but data... Duplicated data, uh, we all know in a distributed system, is a pain in the neck. And so we, if we can avoid that to some degree, then yeah, that's not so bad. So if we look here, so OK, the product catalog, um, the product has been split up into two pieces, the inventory data and the product catalog shows up here. And also the order splits up in a buying and a shipping order somehow. Come back to that later in a second, hopefully. And then look around here, we say, Nothing, yeah, yeah. Oh, they're working on the same data. Does it make sense to put them together? A well, good question. So let's think about that for a minute. Well, same data, but different actors. And I said, oh, the actors are usually some indicators for cohesion boundaries, and so usually, hmm. On the other hand, hey, we don't need to replicate that product database which is really cool. So have that in one service, in one place. No need to replicate that force and back between the people who changed that and who used that and so on. And in this case, I would just say, OK, if we are finished up our reasoning, we say, yeah, let's unite those two things. It's, it's OK. So the overall trade-off, we think it's better if we put them together than if we keep them apart, because this having the data in one place outweighs these lower cohesion between the two services, unless we have a very different architectural style for the front ends and so on, which I sketched before. But here we assume that it's fine. So it would like that. We have the product catalog service, which supports both of them. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, I'll just move them over here. Uh, so. Here is some kind of relation in between because a shopping cart usually turns into an order or into nothing. <laughs> well, so same kind of data, more or less. Uh, does it make sense to put them together? So it's some kind of sequ sequential cohesion between those two things, but could work on the same data, but unification, yeah, we don't really need that. Uh, uh. And here's no clear answer, um, in my opinion. So there are different aspects to ponder, and I, I, I didn't describe them, so we don't know them. Like, do we really need different representation for that? Is the UI part of the service or not? Because maybe that drives out. And how would this payment, which is only needed for checkout, interfere with, interfere with all these things and so on? And so you could end up in both places. Um, I think in this. For the sake of simplicity, we say, yeah, it's fine to unite them. And then, oh, sorry, 
we have put them together in the order creation server. And then some more things to think about, like uh, we have this order, buying order, shipping order, also putting that together. Um, here, uh, my reasoning would be, again, we could argue about that. And if we were in a real project, you would argue about that. I would really want you to argue and have an argument with me about that so that we would figure out which is the best trade-off. Yeah, say, so yeah, well, they have not so much commonalities, and the shipping order is more or less ephemeral thing. So uh, we need the shipping order until the parcel is sent out, and then we can forget about that. The buying order we still need, and, there, and we don't need so much information in the shipping order, and there are different actors, well, and so on. So less commonalities, different actors, yeah, well, let's keep them apart. On the other hand, we figured out also that by splitting up the product information, we have no idea who updates the uh, inventory information, and then we they need to create another use case for that. And now the warehouse employee does that, which still makes a lot more sense because the warehouse employee usually knows if there are still items in stock or not, and not that person somewhere in the office who takes the stuff. And so we might end up with a picture like that. Hmm. Well, nice. Any better than the other picture? Hmm. Again, the same question. How good is it in terms of remote communication? Let's go back for the checkout and the shipment process and see how our core business use cases are supported. Well, looks a bit different. I mean, we can't get away from the payment provider call. But the rest, in one use case, also quite nice. Well, so what we learn here is findings. All the use cases are robust and fast. They're the core use cases. Disclaimer, we were lucky. It's not always that easy. But again, with a simple example, I, I mean, I couldn't take a real world example, a huge one, but with that example, we found a way to slice these functionalities in a way that our core use cases are supported nicely. Also, the uh, supporting the data maintenance use cases are still the same, so also in one use case. Uh, roughly five minutes. This will be hard, but I give you the gist of the rest. Trade-offs. I mean, we're talking about architectural decisions, and I still see too many people running around selling snake oil. So first, before we talk about trade-offs, the two first laws of architectural work. The first law is every decision has its price, also this decision that I just made. No decision is for free. So if anybody comes around and says that, this new architectural thing has only upsides. This person is either lying or trying to sell you snake oil. Every decision has its downsides, no matter how cool you think it is. And the second thing is, is as important, you can only evaluate a decision in a given context. So there is no general good or bad. It's good in this context. And it's quite high chance that it's bad in that context. So there's nothing. Again, if someone tries to sell you that this is a good general architectural concept in all situations, this person either has no clue or tries to sell you snake oil. It's up to you to decide which one is worse. So, Having said that, are there any trade-offs in what I did? Of course, I mean, yeah, sure, there are trade-offs. So the question, uh, first we had the data all nicely put together. Now we have torn that apart. At least it feels like that. So let's spend a few seconds about that. Again, for the example and a few general recommendations before we hopefully then end up. I told you it was way too much. I put it in here. So if we look into that and we say, yeah, well, that looks so bad. Now it's all distributed. This picture is misleading. I wouldn't say it's lying, but it's misleading. So if we go through this picture one by one and think when we use uh, all the things, it's I'm not going into all the details here, but you never use that stuff, this data model, in the real world anytime. You only need use pieces of the information in different places. So it's not so bad if we split that up. So for instance, if we think about the trade-off that we did here, so 
we have the need to copy some data from the customer and the product catalog service over to the order creation. But the order, is, the, the order is immutable after we created it, and we have a copy in there. If you change your name the next day after you put your order, in the order is still your old name. If you move to a different place the next day after you place the order, the order still has the old address, which even makes a lot more sense for you, maybe not one day after, but two years after you move to a new place. Also, you move to a new place two years after you ordered something. And now suddenly the order is, has been redirected back in time to your new place. No, you don't want to have that. So it's a copy. And the nice thing, if we can do that via front end, more or less. So we have the customer information front end, so, and we just can copy it over. So no special mechanism required in here. We still have that by leaving that apart. We need some kind of signal me uh, signaling, signaling mechanism, but still no reconciliation mechanism. So if checkout is completed, we have to inform the warehouse service in some way. By putting these services together, or these use cases together, we got rid of the need to replicate or um, reconciliate and keep them in sync, different um, databases, so that we have the same data spread around, which makes life a lot easier in this case. So yeah, well, it was some arbitrary decision I made, but that's what I, made, what I meant with trade-offs. I think this is more important than having the high cohesion inside the service. And then and these, putting these together and having these together, the order creation, leaves us from the need to have another um, signaling, me signaling me mechanism. So in this place, in this specific example, we have a minimal need to transfer data between services, so we're even safe on that side. So most things we can solve via front-end stand standard data transfer solutions, which can even be as simple as a batch file which then says, here are the, all the new orders, just pick them up whenever you like. And so we don't need, need something specific in there. Again, it's not always that nice and simple. And if it's not always that nice and simple, we have to think about reconciliation and all that stuff. Just very briefly, because we could have a whole talk about that, just to sketch out, there are some options. So even here, it could hit us. For instance, um, depending on the business rules, we would, uh, would say, yeah, maybe the customer should be able to update the um, payment information while checking out the order or in the customer's health care, and then we would have to send that over there to the customer's health care, that information. Or that we can only order a product whenever it's still in stock. I mean, it's a business rule, but if we want to implement that, we have to put that over there. Okay, and so how can we do that? General mechanisms, then people say, yeah, let's go back to a shared database. Well, we had, an, we had a reason why we wanted to uh, move over to services, so let's not do that. Uh, distributed transactions, well, if you want to even have an even worse hell than you had before, have fun with that. It doesn't scale so well, and it's brittle, and everything has to be available, and so on. So usually it doesn't help you in your scenarios. And eventual consistency, and the people say, yeah, but we need asset transactions. And I always say, no, you don't need asset transactions. But it's a business requirement. No, it isn't. We just told our uh, business people for 40 years, ask us for asset transactions. And OK, eventually they picked up the idea. But there is nothing in the real world which is asset. The real world, in the best case, is eventually consistent. Usually, it's simply inconsistent. So asset transaction has a value, which is a great programming model. It's a lot easier to reason about asset transactions than about reasoning about eventual consistency. So it's a much harder programming model, eventual consistency. But from terms of functional requirements, they're fine. And they lead to low coupling, high availability, so they support these things. So in the end, yeah, mostly like that. And implementing eventual consistency, batch pull is an idea. So like this, OK, whenever I'm ready, I ask you for the new information. You can even do that with RSS feeds. In the end, it's a batch pull. Or you have some kind of bootstrapping and delta updates if the batch pull is too slow for you, if it takes too long until you get the updates. So you do sort of a pull in the beginning, so a snapshot, whatever, and then you get all the updates as a delta. And Whenever you get out of sync, you can restart all the stuff. And these days, with Kafka, distributed logs became quite popular, where you were able to put all of these ideas together and um, then um, still 
if Kafka fails, have a plan how to recover from that because it's still a distributed system. It's a great tool, but it goes down and you have no plan to come back up um, after you lost your events. Well, I don't want to be in your company then. Single source of truth, yeah, let's skip that and wrap up because as I said, I put way much. It, it's possible to implement that, okay? We have all the mechanisms in place. Go for eventually single source of truth, eventually consistent single source of truth, and then you're fine. So what did I talk about first? Don't distribute functionality unless you really need to. Go for low coupling, high cohesion, <coughs> and prefer the horizontal decomposition in distributed systems. The magic for slicing functionality is in the behavior, not the data. We heard that before. So maybe go for use cases or go for a different approach. Go for event storming, go for whatever suits you need to figure out how are the interaction patterns and how can you try to avoid crossing service boundaries while fulfilling, fulfilling such a request. By the way, um, I left all, uh, prefer eventually, eventually consistency and value the timeless wisdom. The insights are still valuable, but update the instructions for today. Um, I left out a lot of things like, for instance, horizontal call chains, uh, decent dis discussion about um, reusability, pros and cons, and so on. So there would be a lot more we could talk about, but I'm already talked long enough, and I'm not I have no idea how you survived that, to be honest. <laughs> brave, brave, tough crew. You've seen worse, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's even better here over talking than going back to business. I hope not. Anyway, and so as a last word, um, this was just an idea. Maybe it helps you, maybe it doesn't. And always keep in mind, silver bullets are still out of stock. Even Amazon doesn't have them. And if they don't have, we probably don't have them either. Thanks a lot for your time, your patience, and everything else. Thank you.